So let me uh, just tell you a story, uh, mainly for the students, about how, uh, in, how I became interested in what I've done for the last, I won't tell you how many years, but the slides I'm going to show you, most of them were prepared before you were born. So that gives you an idea of how uh, uh, long I've been in this field. <clears throat> so uh, I call this building a scientific career based on curiosity-driven research, which is what I've done my entire career. By the way, the green uh, filaments that you see in the single cell are uh, intermediate filaments, and they're made of vimentin. Oh, there we go. So um, in the upper left, is an image that I took of a thin section electron uh, micrograph, which I can't seem to highlight. Uh, but it does show uh, what I thought were three different uh, cytoskeletal filaments. And if you look at the lower picture image, so uh, this is a cross section of a fibroblast. And it shows uh, microtubules which everybody knew about at the time. And uh, uh, these smaller dots are actually intermediate filaments, which I became very interested in. And just below the plasma membrane, frequently you see bundles of actin. And of course, actin and microtubules have been studied extensively for many, many years. Intermediate filaments, though, have not had uh, the same attention. And um, we were convinced uh, based upon our findings early on, the 10 nanometer intermediate filaments were a third type of cytoskeletal system, <clears throat> and that they interact with microtubules to maintain their normal organization. And this was way back in the early 1970s. I did this when I was a postdoc, actually. I started working on these. But the first setback for me, and why I became even more stubborn and persistent, was a paper, which you see here on the left, <clears throat> uh, which was published in the Journal of Cell Biology based upon the effect of uh, microtubule inhibitors such as colchicine and mecotazole, intermediate filaments will retract back towards the nucleus. And as you'll see, this is because they're dependent on microtubules for their uh, organization. But the paper <clears throat> actually said the evidence suggests uh, this was published in the Journal of Cell Biology, an interconversion between the neurofilaments, which are intermediate filaments in neurons, and <clears throat> the neurotubule, which is microtubule, and raises the strong possibility that one subunit protein is shared by the two, uh, <clears throat> by the two structures. Well, this may seem innocuous, but actually it took me seven years to get my first NIH grant before because of this erroneous paper. I didn't put the authors down, but I know one of them is still alive, <laughs> living in New York. So here, uh, this really made us go and uh, isolate and characterize uh, intermediate filaments from fibroblasts. And this is one of our, of our early papers, where we isolated that uh, retraction of intermediate filaments, which we called a, a cap the retraction structure. And uh, I should mention that up on the right is a real unadulterated gel. It was a tube gel. And what you see is actually what we got. Um, I'll show you another one, actually. You can see some smaller bands in there. But you make very clean intermediate filaments uh, from fibroblasts using this uh, technique. So the next slide uh, I'll show you. Oh. There it is. Um, it, it turns out that in order to prove that intermediate filaments were separate from microtubules, we had to, and were distinct from microtubules, we had to uh, prove this biochemically. So we managed to isolate intermediate filaments intact using that technique I showed you on the previous slide. And then we had to make antibodies. And in those days, antibodies uh, were made in, typically in rabbits. And we had to demonstrate their specificity. So actually, this is called an Ochterlony uh, double immunodiffusion plate. And this took four to five months to develop 
in the refrigerator. But we finally proved that we had a specific antibody to the intermediate filament structural proteins that did not react with T, which is, uh, was uh, uh, cow brain tubulin. And uh, in order to prove that, this was very early days uh, of immunofluorescence. So in order to prove that we had a good antibody, we could show that those, the colchicine induced, in this case, the blastin induced juxtanuclear, this is the nuclear uh, region, caps of intermediate filaments did not stain the, uh, the paracrystals of tubulin that form in, uh, in vimblastin. So then we had to prove something else. We knew there were very dynamic structures because of the effects of nicotazole and any drug that would disrupt microtubules or actin would cause changes in intermediate filaments. <clears throat> And we knew that this probably was because they were moving around in cells. But these were early days, and we couldn't really prove that. So we did some other things. And one was, first, we, we tried biochemically to show that they were dynamic. But it turns out that be, you can isolate a complete intermediate filament network, which still looks like a cell, with no microtubules, no actin. And when you run it on a gel, you don't see any tubulin, you don't see any actin, but you do see intermediate filaments and their associated proteins. Um, the problem we had was that vimentum, which was a protein that we were working on at the time, which was probably not the best one to work on, but we had started with it, and it was before we realized that there were 75 members of the intermediate filament family, so they're encoded by many different genes, that we, <clears throat> we could not find any soluble pools. Almost everything in the cell that was composed of intermediate filaments was readily pelletable at low speed. And if you extracted cells with high salt detergent and included calcium, there was no actin and no microtubules. But um, in order to show that they were dynamic, we had to do quite a few things over the years, but of course the most exciting one was, let's see if I can change the slide, was the introduction of, uh, of GFP. And actually this afternoon you're going to hear from the discoverer of how to use GFP, Martin Chalfie. You should, you should all attend that talk. But here is an image, let's see if I can show this, but these small particles which are called unit length filaments. And these short filaments <coughs> here move at very high rates of speed. And they actually, if you treat the cells with nicotazole uh, or uh, another microtubule inhibitor, they stop moving very rapidly. In the next slide, it'll show you that because the most important thing for more recently was for us to show that long intermediate filaments can move. These are fully polymerized filaments. OK. So we'd shown basically the molecular motors that run along microtubules uh, move short pieces of filaments, and what we call unit length filaments, which are the assembly precursor of long filaments. And uh, just recently, with Amy Robert and Veloji Gelfand, who are my collaborators, I can show you on the left See if that one works. That works. You can see that long filaments, this photoactivatable, photoconvertible uh, EOS vimentin. And uh, let's show it once more quickly. So the bright spot in the middle is where the intermediate filaments are activated. And you can see that long ones move also. And they're constantly moving. They're very dynamic. And we've discovered quite recently uh, that KIF-5B, a specific isoform of kinesin, uh, and on the right, we use CRISPR-Cas9 to knock out this KIF-5B, and you can see that the filaments don't move. So we've come all the way to learning that the filaments are very dynamic. They're not stable. They move along microtubules. And here's a specific motor that they move along. 
Let me see if I can change this. And uh, this paper is now in eLife uh, under review. And um, basically what we're learning, uh, if you look up top, is where, in fact, uh, the Vimentum binding domain is by truncating the various domains in the heavy chain of kinesin, because we know that the, uh, the light chain, uh, which binds many cargos, is not involved in moving uh, by mentin. Let's see. This is, shows you that from the time I started, actually in the early 70s, uh, we called the protein intermediate filament protein or 10 nanometer uh, diameter filament protein. We now know <coughs> uh, that it's called Vimentin, which began in about 1978, 79. And if you look at the number of papers that have appeared over the years, you'll see that there's a plateau, but we've gone way up so that in 2016, there were over 1,400 papers published on Vimentin. So the field is growing. And, uh, but this plateau is because of this paper, which was totally incorrect. It was published in Cell, which, as you know, has high impact. But it's another good lesson. And uh, in fact, uh, it turns out that that mouse, which uh, was reported as phenotype less, has all of these phenotypes, which are hard to read. But there are about 30 to 50 different phenotypes in the vimentinol mouse, which have been discovered since that paper was on. And at the top, I say, I, I give you a review of a, one of our recent uh, program project grants, which, in which the reviewers on the study section at the NIH still say that the vimentin KO mouse that is central to many of the proposed studies has a mild or negligible phenotype. Well, this is totally incorrect. And in fact, um, we had to resubmit the grant with this table. And now we know that we're going to get the money. But it turns out we're being held up by President Trump because there's no budget in the United States. And the government closes down every few days. <laughs> but basically, we now know that intermediate filaments are involved in many different uh, uh, phenomena, cell shape, uh, determination and maintenance, cytoskeletal crosstalk, mechanical integrity of cells, adhesion, signal transduction, cell motility, organelle positioning, and uh, actus templates from microtubule assembly. And we have many collaborators all over the world uh, who have gotten interested, especially physicists and engineers who have helped us tremendously, and also uh, uh, the use of cryo-EM tomography. So thank you very much. <laughs>